Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone out to the September 15th, 2022 town council meeting here in the town of Barnstable. My name is uh, Matthew Levesque. I am the, uh, the president of the Barnstable Town Council. And without further ado, Assistant Town Clerk Janet Murphy for the roll call, please. Councilors. Atlas. Here. Clark. Here. Cullum. Here. Rap Grissetti. Present. Levesque. Yes. Mendez. Here. Neary. Here. Schnepp. Here. Shaughnessy. Starr. Here. Steinhilber. Here. Ten. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. And this, uh, I do need to ask if anybody is recording this meeting and if you are to make your presence known. Not seeing any, if we all please rise, hands on our hearts, recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And then please remain standing for the moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Now I'm gonna make my way down to the podium for a couple of presentations. Now that we're back in person, I thought it would be a good idea to recognize a couple of individuals and, uh, and moving forward if we can do this uh, and recognize those, especially those you know, coming out of COVID, now, again, now that we're in person, to those longstanding members of our community that have devoted uh, a vast amount of time, personal time, uh, to be on a board committee or commission. Uh, the first gentleman I'd like to recognize is Alex Wodalakis. The Town of Barnstable, Barnstable Town Council, does hereby recognize and thank you, Alex Wardalakis, for 14 years of service to the residents of Barnstable as the member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mr. Wardalakis was first appointed by the Town Council in 2008 as an associate member, and in 2010 he was moved in a regular member position and continued this service until June 30, 2022, and signed with the Barnstable seal by myself, Matthew Levesque. I also, from a personal perspective, um, before I became a town councilor, I was an associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I learned a lot. Um, first, uh, I served, um, um, I believe, uh, our building commissioner, Brian Florence, was the chair, and when Brian became our building commissioner, moving from the town of Dennis, Alex took over as chair at that point in time. I learned so much, obviously a lot from Brian and also from Alex, really how a meeting's run, um, how to you know sometimes uh, de-escalate uh, uh, certain situations, and uh, and really just learn a lot about zoning and the things that um, directly affect people and and when to have grace and when to hold um, to a, a certain zoning an ordinance or a bylaw when it was appropriate. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alex to the podium and to receive his award. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I would like to invite you, if you'd like, to say a couple of words, if you like. A 
I'll keep it under 25, 30 minutes. Um, it was a pleasure serving on the, on the, uh, the zoning board. It was great. Um, I forced both Matt and uh, Nick Atlas off the zoning board. They found shelter, I guess, in another town uh, avenue. But it was a pleasure. Um, we were very lucky in the town. I have a wonderful staff. I, I saw Elizabeth was here. Um, she was a great resource. Um, it was really, a, a really my pleasure. It was, I encourage people. Um, I know a lot of people are probably tuning in to watch me tonight because it's been a while <laughs> since I've been on. Um, so it was really a pleasure. I encourage people to do participate. Uh, you get a lot back. You do get to learn. Uh, you meet wonderful people. Um, and remember when you're on a town board and committee that these are your neighbors, either full-time, part-time, or otherwise, and uh, just welcome people to the town, and that's a great way to do it. So I appreciate you letting me serve on the board for so long. Um, thanks again. Thanks, Alex. The next presentation, this is a very unique um, no, individual, I can say that because he's a friend, but uh, the time, really, that was devoted over the years, and, um, and just want to uh, honor my friend, Joseph O'Brien, uh, in recognition and appreciation of 40 years, 40 years of dedication as a member of the Barnstable Recreation Commission and later on committee, 1982 to 2022. And... Um, I also uh, consider Joe to be a friend. Uh, we first met when I was uh, on the board at Barnstable Little League and later the president of Barnstable Little League uh, way back in 2013 when we were looking to build new fields and, and make a, a really a place uh, where you know, our boys and girls could play baseball uh, that was really premier here in, on Cape Cod in the town of Barnstable. And I think that we did a pretty good job of trying to get those things started. And it's appropriate that um, Mike Clark is here as well and, and Chris Joyce as well. I know they, they put a lot of work into those fields and uh, we couldn't do it without them either. But without further, that's my personal experience, but there was so much more. I mean, really, right down to the, uh, the as we know, best pickleball courts here on Cape Cod, right in, uh, in the heart of Marston's Mills. And uh, there's so many things I could say, you know, Joe, but I just really appreciate you and your dedication to the town. So thank you very much. So without further ado, Joseph O'Brien, 40 years. <laughs> You take all the time you want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my wife told me, keep it short, so I will. Um, it, it's my short, so I don't know how short that's going to be. But um, I did want to take the opportunity to uh, thank you for uh, this great uh, honor. Um, it was an honor to serve the town um, for so long. Um, I did enjoy every single minute of it. Um, I, I want to thank my wife, first of all, my wife Beth, um, for putting, uh, putting, putting up with me being gone. Although I will throw a little bit of a caveat in there. I think she uh, ab actually liked the fact that she got her alone time when I was you know, at the meetings and doing all the things that I was doing for the rec commission. So, um, but no, I, I do appreciate it. Um, I, I had the unique opportunity to, over the years, to serve with, I think, um, every director, um, starting um, with Jack Hare um, in 1982. Um, then moved on to David Curley, um, and the recently uh, retired Patty Machado. Patty Machado and I go back a long way in that we were friends for a long time also. So um, got a real kick out of serving with her and working with her over the years. Um, and and um, all the, all the, safety, uh, all the um, recreation directors um, were, you know, so good to work with. Um, very unique and did a really good job. I think um, I can say unequivocally that um, Town of Barnstable has the best rec department um, throughout the years that, um, and, and I was blessed to uh, be able to serve on the rec commission. So um, really appreciate that. I appreciate all the people I served with. Um, I appreciate and thank uh, Lynn 
uh, Poyant. She was with us for a number of years, and then she moved up, and um, now Maddie Noonan is there, and I served with her for a little bit. And I got a little glimpse of uh, working with John Gleason, uh, who is the new um, uh, recreation director. Um, I think, um, as I said to John, he... Uh, he has big shoes to fill with Patty leaving, but uh, he he's real good. He's real good at what he does in his own right, and uh, I think he'll do a fabulous job. Um, and and I do echo some of the things that Alex was talking about as far as serving on uh, town boards and uh, and um, I, I I really reach out to the people that are watching tonight. Um, it's really rewarding um, that we can do a service for our town, and you get a lot back. I remember uh, one of the big reasons that I wanted to serve uh, on the Recreation Commission is my dad, you know, growing up used to say, you know, you really got to give back. Um, I went through all the recreation programs in the town of Barnstable, so he really echoed the fact that you really got to give back to the town, and, and um, I feel like I've, I've tried to do that over the years, so um, I think you know, thank my dad up, you know, and, and I really thank my mom. I think my mom's watching tonight. So uh, really appreciate, you know, the upbringing that they gave me. And um, thanks again. Really thank, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Joe. And I did want to open the floor if any counselor wanted to um, make any comment in regards to either one of these two gentlemen. Anyone? Councilor Atzlis. Well, since, since Alex brought it up, yes, I was, uh, he and I joined the zoning board together in 2008. We were both associate members. Uh, we both joined to learn a lot, but as Alex probably remembers, uh, we were also there that fateful day when um, the zoning board was decimated um, and but Alex stayed on. Uh, he was part of the foundation, uh, along with Brian Florence, for what the zoning board became, and still is. And I just want to acknowledge his um, his time, effort, and perseverance. Nice job, Alex. And Joe, um, don't have to see, you know we've known each other a long time. Uh, your commitment to the rec commission uh, is one that uh, was motivating for me to get involved with other things here in town or uh, outside of uh, town with other organizations. You really set the example for a lot of people in town. And let's not forget one of his lasting projects he worked on is the soon to be uh, new bathrooms and uh, snack bar at the Little League Field. So um, that was in a way your final act. Um, maybe they'll name, name it after you. Uh, but anyways. Was a yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and for the short time I was on the rec commission, I enjoyed it. Um, so thank you. Appreciate your service. Look forward to seeing you in the neighborhood. Anybody else like to say anything? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And, uh, now is the time, uh, and thank you again for that. Uh, 40 years, I think it was worth saying one more time. And again, Alex, thank you for your time as well. Uh, so that being said, um, moving on, I think it's time for public comment. Anybody in the public first, public comment? Not seeing any, do we have any? Yes, um, we have oh, one yeah. person um, and um, her name is Jessica Simmons. Jessica? If you're with us. Jessica, you have three minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you. Hi, good evening, town council members and staff. My name is Jessica Simmons, and I live year round in Indiana. I'm here this evening representing Barnstable No Place for Hate. 
We are an all-volunteer organization that values diversity, equity, and inclusion, and works to support the civil rights and human dignity of all people. One of our priorities is advocating for the provision of affordable, low-cost, accessible housing in Barnstable. We are experiencing a major housing crisis on Cape Cod. On July 14th, the WCAI radio program, The Point, provided an excellent understanding of this emergency. The program entitled Housing for All clearly lays out the problems and causes and actions that some Cape and Island towns are now taking and can be listened to on the WCAI website. Eileen Elias and Ian Burke presented at the town council meeting in July. Nancy and Paul Thompson presented to you on September 1st. I'm the third advocate to bring this to your attention. We received a letter sent by email on July 21st from Eileen Elias stating that Barnstable No Place for Hate is requesting that the town council commit to a leading a comprehensive coordinated housing development planning process that includes all housing stakeholders, individuals, and those from for-profit, public, and private organizations. There still is no, been no response to this letter. This meeting that we're requesting would help address the growing low-cost affordable housing crisis by receiving recommendations on needed action steps. Other towns in the Cape, including Falmouth, Yarmouth, Sandwich, and Brewster, are addressing the zoning challenges and passing available properties to develop and expand affordable housing availability. An important first step is for the town to require the development of a twin breadth housing to increase the number of affordable options to at least 70 units. If our town does not lead in addressing this crisis, we will find ourselves unable to attract teachers, police, firefighters, healthcare workers, and other key providers that will go to work where they can find a place to live that they can afford. We've already heard of at least one prospective teacher to the Barnstable school system was told by a real estate agent to find a different job off Cape. What will life economically and personally be like here without these essential workers? This, ladies and gentlemen, affects us all. As members of the town council, you represent each town resident and can help prevent these issues from occurring. The crisis is here now. We are asking town council members to take on your role in ensuring affordable, low-cost, accessible housing in Barnstable and take responsibility for what can occur if this housing is not available for essential workers. You can and must bring together all stakeholders to determine causes and find mitigation. The Barnstable No Place for Hate Committee looks forward to working with you to address the housing crisis, and we request your response to our letter and each of this organization's presentations to you. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Anybody else join us last minute, Director Poyan? That is all for public comment. Thank you. Any response to public comment? Vice President Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Jessica, for continuing the line of advocacy for housing, a very important issue here in town. I, I wanted to announce two uh, opportunities to have some direct impact on the housing crisis in our community. And uh, next Wednesday, September 21st at 6 p.m. at the Barnstable Adult Community Center, that's the old senior center on Route 28, there will be a community housing forum. This is part of our housing production plan. This is really an opportunity to be heard and I would invite anybody in your coalition and the public to participate in that meeting. There's also a virtual option if you can't be there in person. Also, we have several vacancies on our town's housing committee and uh, such that we can't even have a quorum to meet. And I really urge uh, people out there who, who believe passionately in housing, um, consider joining that committee. And uh, you just need to contact our town council administrator, Cynthia Lovell, for an application. Thank you. Any other response to public comment? Thank you, everybody. Okay, and again, I would like to echo Vice President, um, you know, Ms. Simmons, and not only do you uh, represent the housing, but all the other, many other needs uh, with the organization, No Place to Hate. So I appreciate if you're still listening, uh, your involvement with that as well. Um, I do also want to recognize uh, Council-elect Paul Cusack from Precinct 5, who's in the audience. Um, congratulations, and I look forward to you uh, getting sworn in on Monday and uh, being with us on the dais the next meeting on October 6th. So I did want to recognize Councilor-elect Cusack. So, uh, so without further, oh, I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. 
Uh, just to follow up on uh, Councillor Schnepp's um, suggestion with regards to the housing, there is an online survey um, that you can participate in uh, to take the housing needs survey. So I think you'll find that on the planning page. Thank you for that, Councillor Rapkosetti. Any other before we move on? Town Manager Communications. Okay. Um, Town Manager Mark Ellis, Town Manager Communications in person. Good evening, Mark Ellis, Town Manager. It's nice to be here in person. Hello to all of you and those viewing. Um, we'll begin the town manager's update for September 15th with Ann Quirk, our town clerk, providing us with, um, I guess, an election update or a post-primary update. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> Now that you're embarrassed. Now that I'm embarrassed, get my, am I red? Oh my goodness. Let me just say that I believe that any town clerk in the town of, in, in Massachusetts could have handled this because we all go to conferences, we learn as much as we can and we try to bring it back to our offices. So uh, I'm a firm believer in that uh, it's, you know, anybody could have done this. It just was not a lot of fun. Um, my morning started about 4.15 on election day with a phone call saying we can't get the safe open. So um, that's how it started. But I have to tell you that the town of Barnstable has the most amazing people that work for it because everybody came out to help, everybody. I, I couldn't have done it with all the help that I did get, I mean, it was crazy how many people were there. The police were there, the DPW was there, Lynn Poyant was there. I, I, I was on the phone with her before six in the morning. Uh, it's, it's, you have to let as many people know as you can when something like this happens. And I've been told by the Secretary of State's office that this has never happened in Massachusetts. So I guess we made history, folks. Not the best way to do it, but we made it. Um, one of the things that Lynn did coordinate with the police department was to get those reverse 911 calls out as fast as she could. Um, we, she did, they were done three times during the course of the day to let people know what was happening. We did have ballots that were printed by Sunderland Printing. Um, we had them at the polling locations starting at just before 11 o'clock. And uh, that, again, was a coordinated effort to get everything out there. Uh, I, it just, it was an amazing day. And I'm thrilled that it all came, uh, it came through and we were on, the, on this side of it. I think that's a good thing. Um, at one o'clock, I was asked to do a statement to, <laughs> to some of the newscasters that were everywhere. And um, I walked into this room and came up to the podium and saw six microphones there and I was like, oh no. But um, yeah, we I just, you tell the truth. This, this is what's happened. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get through the day and we're trying to make sure that everyone had a, an opportunity to vote. And by staying open until midnight, they did all have an opportunity to vote. Um, we had over a thousand people vote between 8 p.m. and midnight, which speaks to the people that actually came out to vote. The vault was opened at 7.35 p.m. by the locksmith. And he did it in such a way as to protect that vault door because he said it can be fixed. So we're gonna go forward with that. I have no idea when it's gonna be fixed. And then we do have another election coming up real soon. And uh, just so you, you're aware that all of those people who didn't use vote by mail, they're all gonna get another card. It's, it's going out this week, as a matter of fact. So there'll be, <laughs> there'll be more vote by mail. Um, what else can I tell you? I can tell you that 
I'm happy that it's over. I can tell you that we had a good turnout in a few of our precincts. Uh, we actually normally do between seven and 10% of our voters come out for a primary, a state primary, and we had 27%. So that's a tribute to us too, for getting those paper ballots out there and hand counting them until the wee hours of the morning. So it all, it all came out and I, Hope you don't have any questions, but if you do, I'm here. Does anybody have any questions? Also, Colin, please. I don't have a question, but I think you should call it the post-traumatic election <laughs> update, um, first of all. And all, I just wanted to comment on the poll workers and you know their volunteerism staying there till midnight. I mean, that's a huge, you know, we're here honoring people who volunteered for 40 years. It must've felt like 40 years to the people who started at 7 a.m. and and we're there till midnight. So, I mean, I, I, I just appreciate that so much. And I'm not diminishing what you and your office did or, or Lynn's office, um, but it's in times of crises, it's nice to see people come together like that. So, thank you. It's funny you. that you should say that because they did stay until three and four o'clock in the morning counting ballots. And the best thing was that I had people, I had town clerks from Brewster, Falmouth, Truro, Yarmouth, Dennis. Dennis, I mean, they came out to help and they had just finished their elections. That poor girl in Truro has the old crank machine. She doesn't have a machine. She has the old crank paper ballots. So when she came out, I said, are you coming all the way from Truro? She said, absolutely. And she went into one of the precincts and they were thrilled to have her because they'd never done paper ballots. They'd never had to do that counting. So she whipped them into shape. Council Starr, please. I'd, I'd like to echo what um, Ms. Gullum just said, um, that um, I, it was great to hear that everybody jumped in. Um, I know you've got a lot of help regularly. There's a lot to do with the election. And uh, um, I was thinking, also thinking that maybe as a town council, we should send letters to the Board of Selectmen commending the clerks for helping us. I mean, I think we should acknowledge that. Maybe we can work on that at some sure. point. Absolutely. Because that's a long ways to come when they're doing their own elections. Thanks. That'd be Be great. And better luck on the next one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Vice President Schiff. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Anne, if, if the vault's not going to work, what, what's plan B? Well, I, I need a space. I, I definitely need a space that can be locked up. That we, be, The ballots are going to be coming out by the end of the month or the beginning of October anyway. I'm, I'm not sure how we're gonna do this. Um, my vault, I have a vault on the first floor, but that's where all of the vitals are and all the ancient books. Um, there's not enough space in there. I still have all the tabulators in there, but <laughs> we have to find a space to put all this stuff, I don't know. Are we looking at a supplemental appropriation or? We could be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think whatever needs to get done, I mean, it, it's you. wonderful that we were able to rescue this unfortunate incident, but we Thank wanna you. retain the confidence of our voters going forward. So whatever you need, please ask. Thank you. Council Starr, please. Thank you. Um, so in the past, you've, you've used this room. You've changed the locks on all the doors in this room, and then you don't have to carry them down to a vault and back up every day. Right. So. It, this, it seemed like this time there was a scheduling problem with, say, the Board of Health, the Planning Board, um, because of the use of this dais here. So yes. maybe we could work around that. So That would be great. That would be great if we could do that. But because, obviously, there's going to be more people voting. So probably more vote by mail. And you know the space that it takes because you've been working with us. So. Right. OK. Good. Councilor Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque. And thank you very much, Clerk um, and Clerk, Town Clerk. Um, two things. Uh, perhaps we should, in echoing what Councilor Starr said, we should send a letter of thanks to the um, Association of Clerks for the support that they gave to you um, through the um, not only the education or the, your, your um, training, but for those that, that um, backfilled when we had a, an emergency situation. And secondly, um, is there a way with, that we can help to recruit more poll workers uh, if you think we need more for the November election? 
Um, that's a good thought. I will tell you that power to the polls is sending us people on a daily basis via the internet to interview, to have as poll workers. I mean, literally this morning there were at least five or six on, on my email. So we're, tr we're trying to do that. We're trying to, I've tried to talk to a few people also uh, about being wardens and helping out where, uh, how do I say this nicely? Uh, we have a lot of good people. I have a lot of good people, but some people are to the point where it's too much. So yes, we are, we are doing that. We're, we're engaged in that right now. So if you know someone, send them to us, and we will send them over to HR to get all signed up. OK? Any other comment? I would like to just echo that. Nice job. And I uh, appreciate all that. I was you know, here a little bit earlier than most. And then, uh, but, and then again, thank you to all the wardens and, and the people who stayed up late at night, really, or late in the early in the morning, I should say, to try to be part of the solution. There were a lot of people who were helpers and being part of the solution, even though maybe outside, you know, there was some stories and rumors and different things of that nature. We, we stemmed the tide and, uh, and got it done. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank well, you. Councilor Clark, Just a, last uh, word. <clears throat> thank, sorry for uh, this final comment. But um, the poll workers are not necessarily volunteers. They do get a side. They're, they are paid. Yes, they are paid, and um, they made quite. They will make a, quite a bit of money because it was a very long day and night and morning. So they they will be paid. Some of them were there over twenty hours. Yes. Yeah. Straight. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you again. Thanks Thank for you. the update. Appreciate it. Thank you. Tom Major Ells. Mark Ells, town manager. The Cape has been declared as a level three critical drought level, uh, at, a, at a level three critical drought level by the Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary Beth Card. This declaration will remain in effect until the next declaration anticipated in mid-September. This is basically a ban on non-essential use of water. Barnstable's fire districts have been monitoring the drought conditions through the Commonwealth's Drought Management Task Force. I've given you a link um, in my memo uh, to, to that location. Um, there have been substantial brush fires in other parts of the state. That hasn't been an issue for us here on Cape Cod or in Barnstable, um, but certainly um, we're keeping a close eye on that. No additional regulations or prohibitions have been enacted from a fire department standpoint, primarily because open burning is permitted currently. Isn't it, it's not permitted currently. Um, when we get into the burning season, we're going to have to be looking at this relevant to where we are, um, relevant to this drought. Um, we'll continue to coordinate and monitor the situation with the fire districts and water departments. Residents and businesses can check the mass.gov website, and all you have to do in the search once you go into mass.gov is put in drought and then hit search, and it'll come right up in front of you to, to determine how this might impact that. So to try to lay out all or any impacts, um, even the definition of non-essential water, um, but things like irrigating your lawn, that's not essential. So at this point, during a level three, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, there aren't people out there policing this, though. So for the most part, people are asked to recognize the drought and to not do, not use non-essential water during this period of time. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also reach out to us, and we can try to answer those. You don't have to go to the state, but certainly a fire department, water department, or general, uh, my office, or DPW can certainly be helpful in answering any questions you may have. 
Um, certainly, the the the, the um, Barnstable, the uh, I'm sorry, the um, DPW Water Supply Division has information on its website relevant to this uh, by actual recommendation to me by the Hyannis Water Board and then my adopting that action. And at this time, that's, that action is sufficient relevant to this. As previously reported on July 20th, uh, federal District Court granted the town's motion to dismiss the Clean Water Act lawsuit filed against the town by the Conservation Law Foundation. On August 17th, the CLF filed a motion for reconsideration with the District Court. The town's response to that motion was filed on September 7th. If the court denies CLF's motion, CLF will have a new period of 30 days in which to appeal the court's decision granting the motion's dismissal. Karen Nobers here if you have specific questions about this, um, but otherwise as this progresses, we will keep you advised. We're proceeding with the budget action calendar for FY 2024. The action items in the budget calendar include the meeting of the school committee um, that they're holding as they develop the 2024 proposed operating budget. As noted in the budget action calendar, a joint meeting of town council and school committee is tentatively scheduled for October 20th, 2022. We do that every year. It's required by the charter. Um, we're also preparing the budget instructions for the FY 2024 budget with a plan distribution on Monday, the 19th. Our finance director has reported favorable budget results for revenue and expenses from FY22, last fiscal year, and we'll include um, that information in our five-year projections for 2024-28 uh, that will be issued prior to the joint meeting with the council and the school committee. Uh, for information, you can find much of this information on our website uh, under our finance department. And in some cases, when we're in the midst of budget process, it can be found right, right on our uh, homepage. On July 26, 2022, I provided the Board of Health an update regarding the proposed regulatory changes under consideration by the Department of Environmental Protection to Title V. As previously reported on June 1st, the town of Barnstable was informed of regulatory revisions. The Mass Department of Environmental Protection is developing to ensure that timely actions are taken to restore and protect coastal estuaries that have been impacted by excessive nitrogen pollution. The two regulatory approaches they've developed and plan to publish for public comment shortly provide communities with choices on how to address the growing pollution problems affecting our waters. The two proposed changes involve revising Title V regulations to establish nitrogen sensitive areas for watersheds draining into estuaries where there there is an EPA approved total maximum daily load, a TMDL, which finds that the estuary is impaired by nitrogen. Now for us, that's all of our embayments on the south side, and we have those EPA approved, um, those EPA approved TMDLs. And it has been the basis and a priority within the um, comprehensive wastewater management plan. Secondly, a regulatory revision to formally establish the watershed permit. These permits are 20 year permits that are based on long term wastewater planning that will achieve water quality goals and provide communities the opportunity to utilize a range of approaches, including centralized sewer treatment and innovative approaches. We met with Mass DEP on July 6th to further discuss these proposed changes, and we've drafted a letter summarizing our comments on the proposed changes for DEP's consideration as they finalize their draft regulations. We submitted the written comments on the, uh, on the presentation and anticipate participation in draft review of the proposed regulations as soon as such draft regulations are issued. So they're considering this 
but there are no draft regulations yet for us to take a look at. I've suggested the DEP present these draft changes to a joint meeting to town council and the Barnstable Board of Health as these changes are significant and merit such a presentation. They seemed receptive to that, um, but I also know that this is moving quickly. And I, as I understand it, late fall, maybe November, we're gonna see draft regs and they're talking about adoption by the first of next year. So I hope that they will come down and have that conversation. I have been in conversations with Region 5 um, about this and they haven't indicated that that won't occur. So I'm hopeful um, that that will occur and I'll keep you advised as this progresses. On a little lighter note, the Harbor Master um, within our Marine Environmental Affairs Department will be holding a lottery drawing for three of its currently closed mooring wait lists. The lottery opened today at one o'clock and closes October 1st at midnight. The winners will be drawn at random on October 5th at 1 p.m. And the following locations have been selected for this lottery along with a number of names um, that, that will be, uh, along with the number of names that will be drawn. They're for Katuit Town Dock, Ropes, um, Katuit Oyster Company, Cordwood, that's Cordwood Landing, Ropes Beach area, and Prince Cove. So uh, please take a look at this. Um, this is done from time to time, but this is significant, and the Harbor Master wants to get that word out so anybody who's interested can participate in this. If you want more information, I can certainly have Brian Taylor here um, next meeting to go into detail. Um, but I think now we're going to be coming out. It'll be too late if we wait until that. I'll have to get Brian on television, okay? Because I think your next meeting's October 6th, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, the Planning and Development Department is hosting a community forum already stated by Paula Schnepp and uh, referred to, I think, by Councilor Rap Grissetti on the 21st at 6 p.m. at the Barnstable Adult Community Center. Um, this is focused on community housing. So we do have an opportunity. There is a lot of work going on by our planning department and other staff relevant to housing. And um, I would encourage all to uh, try to participate in this either virtually or in person. And there is also, as referenced by Councilor Rap Grissetti, an opportunity to go onto our website and participate um, in a housing needs survey. We're in a data gathering and planning phase. Um, so please, to the extent that you can participate, participate in this. The Town of Barnstable's Town Barnstable Police Department and the five fire districts would like to invite town councilors and residents to the first ever 55 plus community safety day on Thursday, September 22nd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. This event is free to all and will bring fun education and safety resources to our community's older adults at the Barnstable Adult Community Center, the former senior center, uh, along Falmouth Road. Um, public safety and over 30 community partners will provide our older residents the real world tools and information to keep themselves safe in their homes online and in their neighborhoods. Again, this event is free. There'll be food, gifts, raffles, and so all are welcome, but certainly um, our, our senior population is encouraged to attend on Thursday, September 22nd from 11 to 2 p.m. Over the next several days, staff from the Recreation Division and the HYCC will be engaging with students at Barnstable High School to share information on current employment opportunities and encourage our youth to apply for seasonal positions, including recreation assistance, gym assistance, after school program assistance, and rank assistance. For more information on current openings and to apply for positions, please go to the town's website and you can find all of that information. I also know that our rec department, rec director has reached out directly to um, 
the YMCA, they have a significant shortage of lifeguards, and we are coordinating to see whether any of our lifeguards from the summer are looking to, uh, to, to lifeguard out of summer season. So we're, we're trying to, we're, we're doing a great job with our new athletic director and superintendent over at our public schools in making sure that we're, we're constantly communicating about our youth programming. Um, we're reaching out to our high school in this case to engage our youth in our recreation programs from an employment standpoint. Uh, we're also reaching out to those other partners we have in the community because we know that they're having the same challenges we are. And, you know, in general, um, we're still running at about 70%. So people, as much as we have very desirable work conditions here, uh, people are not applying for our positions, especially um, those that are not full-time. We're, we're seeing a significant um, shortage in that specific area. And we are doing significant outreach to all those in our community relevant to this. That's my update at this point. I'll stop and um, answer any questions. And then Director Santos is going to come up uh, to provide you with an update to what I'm referring to more broadly as our water management plan, but within that, uh, the normal monthly update for the comprehensive wastewater management plan. Thank you, Town Manager Ellis. Questions for Town Manager Ellis? Councilor Cullen. Yes, just a quick question about the vault door. Is what is the status of that? Are we are we are we going to get it repaired by the time? Do you think in time? I, for the I'd next have election? to defer or? to Director Santos if he's had any report on that. Have you had any update on that, Dan? I, I don't have a date, but it's in the works to be repaired. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. And then um, the next thing was this um, 55 plus community safety day. I've seen almost all this information on Facebook from the town, but I've not seen this particular one. Has that been shared on Facebook? I think that's a great way. For some reason I've missed it, so that's awesome. Um, I'm almost there, but not yet. I'm not gonna talk about that part, bye. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Collum. Anybody else, Tom, Vice President Schnepp, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mark, for the report. Um, Going back to your first item on the level three critical drought, um, when I see a ban on non-essential use of water, does that mean no lawn watering? That's, that's what the state's designation as a level three would indicate, yes. So would we need to update our water districts? Um, I think they all have accurate information out there. Not on the websites, so they may need to they may need to improve they may, are it they from deferring? the alternate days to a complete ban, because I think that may not be knowledge of that people. Yeah, I think when you went from, that was a level two, I think it may have changed going to level three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think they may be referring to the state website, but um, I will reach out to all of them. For that because some of our water districts are right on it and some of them not so much okay so I, think well, I i can certainly reach out and um especially ours thank you suggest <laughs> that uh that be updated okay. so yep i can take care of ours council rep Grissetti, please um it's my understanding there is we have not gotten to the emergency drought which the state would have jurisdiction over our local water districts. Right now, the water districts have control, and so therefore, those that have private wells are not under the, the banning of non-essential. So, but if we go to a level four, then the state overrides the local districts and everybody, private wells and public uh, are banned from non-essential. Right. But I think Councilor Schnepp's referring to the fact that the last formal action and recommendation to me by the Hyannis Water Board was a level two action. It has now moved to level three, which is basically a ban on non-essential water use. But that board hasn't met again to be able to act. I'm appointing new members back to that board. We lost our chair and we had a vacancy. So um, we're in the, we filled one in the process of filling that other vacant. Um, I think that there may be action by mid-September and we'll see what that is because if it drops it back to two, um, 
The, the, the thing to also remember on Cape Cod, and certainly Dan's coming up and he can address this better than I, but um, we do have sufficient water on Cape Cod, unlike other parts of the state, though we completely recognize the authority and the significance of this designation. So from a practical matter, we will be able to manage this, but you should be following um, you know, the, the appropriate action during the level that's been um, adopted by the state of Massachusetts. But that's, that's why, I, you know, we don't unilaterally, well, certainly from my side, I wait for the Water Board's recommendation. So that's why that's where it is right now. Gotcha. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions for Tom Major Ellis before we move on to Director Santos? I don't see any. Thank you, Town Manager. I always appreciate it. You're welcome. Good evening, Mr. President, Madam Vice Santos. President, and Town Councilors. It's a pleasure to be here with you all after such an extended time of not doing so. Um, so this is our monthly, what we've started calling our water resources update. And uh, the reason being, we do a lot more than just the comprehensive wastewater management plan, albeit that's very important and will be with us for decades, as you know. Um, we do many, many, many other things related to water resources, freshwater ponds, our water supply we were just talking about, um, water quality, and just to add on a little on, on the drought uh, issue, you know, there are two issues with drought and why it's important. One is fire because it's so dry, we don't want that, and the second is water supply, um, and as the manager said, on Cape Cod, we have, um, we have water quality issues. We do not have water quantity issues. We have a massive aquifer here. Um, and we design and build these systems so that they uh, can deal with fluctuations in annual uh, precipitation. So the groundwater table moves up and down on the order of feet. But our, where our wells draw from is well below that. So there would have to be a really extended drought to drop the water table down to where we would have problems providing water. So I, I guess I just want to uh, have you rest assured that there's not a water problem. Uh, even with this drought, even if we were continuing to water and do all those things, it would, it would really not be impacting our ability throughout the town, not just the Hyannis water system, of uh, providing uh, adequate water supply for potable uses as well as fire flows. We also have lots of storage too. The storage tanks provide us uh, that capacity uh, for emergencies. So uh, with that. Thank you for that. Extra credit. Yeah. So um, doing a little change with this too, and I think we've, we've discussed it with leadership and the manager. Because we have so many different water areas of water resources, uh, we thought maybe from month to month, we could do a little different um, topic. So I can update you on the important aspects of the CWMP, uh, particularly the construction and what's going on in the field right now, uh, but also uh, talk about something that uh, might be, uh, that have, has recently come up or is more of an interest or a concern. And so today, we're going to kick that off after I talk about our construction update um, to uh, discuss our pond, uh, freshwater pond program. And I think you'll find that interesting. Uh, there's a lot going on there. And you have, over the last couple of years, supported that program uh, with your positive votes on appropriation orders. So the construction update will cover the Strawberry Hill Road sewer expansion, um, Route 28 East sewer expansion, uh, which includes the Finney's Lane pump station, which if you've drawn, uh, driven down Finney's Lane, there's no way you're gonna miss that project with that enormous crane there, and uh, vineyard wind construction. And you can see on the map here, uh, color-coded, um, the yellow is our fall uh, sewer work area. 
and the uh, magenta color is the Vineyard Wind project. So for the Strawberry Ro Hill Road sewer project, um, we are on schedule for completion um, in this upcoming spring. And um, to date, we've installed 14,000, a little more than 14,000 linear feet of gravity sewer. And we've completed the work on Craigville Beach Road uh, this summer. And uh, Strawberry Hill Road, we continue the work on there. We worked on Waquocket Lane uh, over this summer, and we'll continue there. Uh, we would be working primarily in Finney's Lane um, uh, for, the, for the season, the construction season, uh, primarily between Waquocket Lane and uh, Connors Road. We are also uh, in the process of installing water supply bypass piping at the uh, northern end of Finney's Lane or the eastern end uh, because we're going to be relocating water mains. But to do that, uh, you have to put in temporary mains, then you can put in the new mains. So uh, that work has to be done before the sewer work and before the vineyard wind duck bank work. So it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a dance of con construction contractors to uh, pull this off. But um, we're very uh, positive that we're going to do that, and we have good contractors and good oversight, and uh, so I'm optimistic. Um, and finally, the sewer pump station uh, work has begun at the intersection of Strawberry Hill Road and Craigville Beach Road. Our uh, 28 East sewer expansion that's uh, putting in uh, part of the backbone uh, uh, sewer mains in Route 28 primarily, uh, but also uh, along portions of uh, Phineas Lane as well. And um, that work includes this large pump station will be the largest one we have, uh, which is going to be very deep and very deep um, excavation. And, and the bottom of that pump station is going to be very deep in the ground. And that's why we have to uh, protect it with sheet piling. And that's what's going on now is we uh, install steel, basically a steel wall around the site so we can excavate down without the wall and the sides uh, collapsing and endangering the work that's been done or the employees that are, that are working on that. Um, and then uh, sewer construction work uh, was going to commence in October and uh, starting at that Finney's Lane pump station and working north. That's also deep construction. This is going to be some of our deepest work. That's because it's a gravity sewer system. And um, to do that, it gets deeper as, as you go uh, so that it can operate via gravity, obviously. And then um, this project should be completed in the winter of 23. But things are uh, back, back in action with construction, as you've seen, I'm sure. And uh, we're fielding the calls, and we get a lot of interest, and people have questions, and we're happy to have them come in and, and, and share what we know with them. We have daily updates with the police and fire and the schools, so they know exactly what we're doing every day to make sure that uh, there's no hiccups if emergency services uh, are needed to get by these areas. And also, uh, the state working on Route 28 and Yarmouth Road, they're back uh, full time as well. They've uh, done some lane changes there. Uh, if you've been through there, you might want to just pay a little more attention because they have changed the lanes for their construction work and uh, it's a little different than it has been. And Vineyard Wind Project, uh, they're intending to uh, complete their duck bank work this spring. Uh, this fall they're working on Strawberry Hill Road. This is where we put in, we move the water, we put in the sewer, now they're following up with the duck bank. Um, and the construction at Cobles, Be Cobles Beach parking lot, they still have work to do there where they cable uh, came on, um, on shore, where they have to do a connection to their duck bank in the parking lot. That work will go on. Um, they're going to be doing testing where they put the duck bank in. Uh, they did some of that this summer in Independence Park where we didn't think there would be much of a traffic issue and that gained them some, gained them some time. And then finally, there's been some questions on paving. Uh, Craigville Beach Road is kind of a mess, and that's uh, been a lot of, lot of work there, a lot of trenching. And what happens is uh, once we uh, do an excavation and puts, put uh, pipes in the ground and put a trench patch, we let that sit for at least 120 days. We want that to settle. 
because once we pave it, we don't want it to settle after we pave and then end up having potholes and cracks and uh, uneven surfaces. So uh, right now our schedule for uh, paving is Craigville Beach Road will probably be the end of this month, the first part of October. I don't have their schedule yet. We've asked them for it. This is Vineyard Wind doing this work and their contractor. I anticipate getting that soon. But their plan is to do that soon and first, and then they'll be moving to West Main Street, Independence Drive, and Attics Lane, the, the uh, duck bank work on the north side that was done uh, last spring. And then in the spring of 23, uh, when the Strawberry Hill Road work's done, they'll uh, do the paving there. And then finally, uh, in fall of 23, Finney's Lane and Waquocket Lane, when the work's done and the settling um, has occurred. So that's the CWMP update. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift gears and move into our uh, Ponds and Lakes program. Excuse me. Uh, which is um, since the um, work with the uh, water resources group that started in 2015 that kicked off the CWMP work, uh, we looked at ponds in our CWMP um, and ponds uh, water quality is considered in that program, but we wanted to have a separate capital program to address the freshwater ponds in Barnstable because there is clearly water quality issues uh, with the freshwater ponds, mostly related to nutrients and then algae blooms, cyanobacteria primarily, uh, but also some um, sediment issues from runoff and things like that. But because it's not regulated, um, it, doesn't, it didn't get the attention that the nitrogen has uh, in the CWMP where we're legally required by the Clean Water Act to make sure we address water quality in our uh, south-facing estuaries, which we're doing. Um, but we felt like, you know, we can't just ignore the ponds and the public would not al allow us to do that. It's just a, a, another equally important resource as our estuaries, our drinking water is, is our freshwater ponds. There are 180 ponds in Barnstable at last count. Um, they seem to pop up regularly and or go away, I guess, when the water table goes down. But uh, 25, of the, 25 of these ponds are great ponds, uh, which are basically, they're, they're a public resource when they're considered a great pond. And that's uh, 10 acres and above. Uh, and most of these great ponds are impaired to one, one degree or another uh, via water quality. And we know that because for the last 20 years, we've been testing our ponds. With 33 ponds that we test uh, every spring, summer, and fall uh, for water quality. So we have a great database and uh, a wealth of information on trends in our freshwater ponds. So this plan that we established two years ago uh, would, was to, uh, through the capital program, evaluate ponds and then implement solutions. Uh, so we went through all the ponds that we were testing and we prioritized them based on a number of criteria, um, the size of the pond, the use, whether there's uh, recreational facilities, ways to water, whether there's uh, fish or fishing, um, the water quality obviously, and uh, on the ponds that really came out at the top of that list were Schubel Pond, which I'm going to talk about tonight, as well as Long Pond in Marsons Mills. Those were the first two that have had um, management plans uh, and water quality monitoring addressed. And then there's a couple others I'll talk about. So in general, uh, what we want to do, nutrients are the issue, a primary issue with freshwater ponds. And the primary nutrient um, is phosphorus. I know you've heard this before. For saltwater estuary, estuaries, it's nitrogen that's driving the water quality, and in freshwater ponds, it's phosphorus. And so um, we want to understand in a holistic way in, in these ponds, what's their status, their water quality status, what the trends have been what, in the past, you know, so is it getting better or getting worse? Um, and also, um, develop uh, alternatives analysis and then uh, move to implementation. So the locations that I mentioned, Shuba Pond in 2020, Long Pond in Marsons Mills, um, Lovell's Pond, that work, monitoring work is underway this year now. 
And then next year, 2023, we're going to move to Lake Waquocket, Burses, and Gooseberry Pond, which are all related in the same area. And we'll be submitting capital requests in this upcoming capital program for that 2023 program. So as I mentioned, ponds are primarily um, impacted by phosphorus inputs. And what the phosphorus does is basically um, fertilizes algae and water plants, which then uh, lower the water quality in the pond. It can choke it off. And ulti ultimately, in a process called eutrophication, uh, end up in a pond dying and not being able to sustain uh, plant or animal life. And we certainly don't want to get there. Um, so our approach was to hire a consultant. And the best consultant for this, uh, they kind of wrote the book, is uh, UMass Dartmouth uh, uh, Marine science and technology. And uh, so we've contracted with them for all these uh, monitoring programs. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a two-year study. Year one is the monitoring. And what we do is we look at water quality, and that's dissolved oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, bacteria, um, uh, clarity, stormwater inputs, uh, septic system inputs, and uh, runoff, uh, just general overland runoff. And they look at all the possible potential sources of nutrients and contaminants that can go into a pond. And then what they do is kind of divvy them up. And they can figure out, based on what the items are, each particular contaminant, and looking at the number of septic systems, for example, or the area that's drained, they're able to figure out what percent of the nitrogen is coming from what source. And the value of that is that tells us, ultimately, how to remediate those sources. Uh, so, and then phase two is developing this management plan, which is basically um, taking that alternatives analysis and then turning that into a program of remediation, which I expect is going to be both short and long term for, for most, of, most of these ponds. So if we turn to Shubal Pond, which we have the final report, we've briefed uh, the neighborhood in Oct uh, August, um, Amber Unruh, uh, project scientist on our team. She's a water, uh, freshwater pond expert. She did a presentation there. And um, we're very glad to have her on staff. She actually went to school and got her master's degree at uh, SMAS. Shulip Pond is about 55 acres and has a maximum depth of about 40 feet in the center. Uh, it's stocked with trout, uh, spring and fall, as you can see here. And the features um, that enable it to be used for recreation or where the public uses the pond are through boat ramps, two boat ramps, beaches, Willimantic Beach, Sand Shores Beach, Fair Acres Beach, and the Evergreen Homeowners Association's Beach. And then there's a town way to water on Shubal Pond uh, Road. And you can see those things identified on the graphic there. So the management plan was completed in 2021. And after review, once they submit these to these, we have questions, we review them, we go back and forth, and we come up with a final product. That plan was released in July of 2022. Uh, it's available on the town website for anyone that is interested in reading it. And uh, just to summarize very briefly, again, this is, this is an overview. Uh, this is a very detailed report. And for those that are interested in reading the report or even in getting a more detailed brief, we are happy to set that up for anyone. Um, it's very interesting. But again, wanted to give you all uh, a flavor for what's going down with these um, uh, pond reviews and management plans uh, so you know what to expect. And, and you might be able to uh, converse with your constituents more knowledgeably. So phosphorus, as I mentioned, is the limiting nutrient. and. Uh, the, uh, the way we're going to improve water quality in Shubal Pond is by reducing phosphorus. The largest f uh, source of that phosphorus in this case, and will likely be in most ponds, is septic systems. But we'll find out for sure. But in this case, it's uh, clearly concluded. And I'll show you a little pie chart in a moment. And so if, the lar if we need to address phosphorus, the largest source is phosphorus. And obviously, we need to have to go after that source in order to make improvement in the water quality. And here's, here's the graphic. Uh, you can see that peach color there. 59% of the phosphorus in the pond comes from uh, septic systems. And the next largest uh, portion of phosphorus 
in Jubal Pond is from sediments that are in the bottom of the pond. What happens is they tend to bind phosphorus, the sediments at the bottom of the pond, and in certain conditions uh, where there's no oxygen, they can release the phosphorus. So that's a source. It's coming out of the sediments on the bottom, uh, and you can see it's 23% of the total, and then the rest is uh, roof runoff from homes, uh, leaders, um, road and driveway runoff, and uh, uh, the pond surface. That's um, uh, rain, basically. You can get some phosphorus through rainfall, atmospheric deposition, they call it, but it's basically in the rain, like acid rain. This phosphorus in rain as well. It's not a big source, but it is one of the sources. So now we look at, uh, we know it's septic systems, we know it's phosphorus, so uh, uh, is it all the septic systems or are there particular septic systems that are a problem? Well, there's a couple of factors with phosphorus in, in freshwater bodies. Phosphorus doesn't move really easily. It tends to bind up, as it does in the sediments in the bottom of the pond, it binds up in soil. And um, so as a septic system releases effluent, the phosphorus attaches to the soil. Now when those soil sites get uh, used up, it moves down a little. And so it takes basically 30 years uh, to go about 300 feet. So what we have here is homes that are within 300 feet of the pond and there's a pink border around there. So that's, that's your area of concern within 300 feet of the pond, given homes that are in the order of 25 to 40 years old. So now you know that this phosphorus likely hitting the water, water body. Um, but the other factor is, do all the homes contribute phosphorus to the pond? And what you have to look at there is groundwater flow. Because groundwater, the, these are kettle ponds, this one in particular, and what that means is basically um, you're looking at the surface of groundwater when you look at that pond. It's like cutting out a hole in the earth, and it just, like at the beach. You dig a hole, it fills up with water. It's the same exact thing. So, but groundwater's moving all the time. And the way it moves into this pond, um, you can see the red area on the map. Those are the homes that are within the watershed to the pond. So all the other homes outside of that red arc that water's going another way. It's not going into the pond. It's actually moving south. So that helps us to understand, okay, we've got to deal with 13 homes. And that uh, 13 homes are contributing that 59% of the phosphorus to this pond. So it's, it's pretty amazing how much phosphorus comes out of septic systems. Um, and this is years after we eliminated phosphorus from you know, laundry soap and dishwashing soap. It's coming from primarily some products and still have it, but our bodies. So the recommendations on the Schubel Pond plan are there's both long-term and short-term. Long-term is that we sewer the area. Take them off septics. Get all the phosphorus sources out. Our CWMP had these, this area sewered in phase three year 20 to 30. Well, that's an awful long time, given that phosphorus is hitting the ponds now. Um, so we've recommended moving it to phase two. It's pretty, pretty much impossible to get there in phase one because we won't have the infrastructure in place to get that far out there. But we can back it up to phase two. But fortunately, um, there's a couple of things we can do in the short term, and one relates to addressing that phosphorus that's coming from the sediments in the bottom. And the way we can do that is with alum treatment, which we've done in other ponds, other communities done it. Alum is aluminum. And basically, it does kind of what the soil does. It rebinds the phosphorus that has been released from the bottom and sets it back down. So it ties it up. It's not in the water. So it's not going to fertilize and be a nutrient for plant growth. Uh, that's easy to do. It's not uh, particularly expensive. And so um, tonight we have an appropriation order uh, to do alum treatment starting in the spring. Probably going to have to do this three to, every three to five years uh, to keep those phosphorus levels down. But, um, and there's no guarantee it's going to 
solve every problem, eliminate the cyanobacteria, because we got to get to a certain level of phosphorus, and just dealing with this part of the phosphorus source is not going to get us beyond that level, but it could help, because there haven't been cyanobacteria blooms in this pond or others forever. You know, they're only recent. So, if, you know, the thinking is if you can get it down, get the phosphorus down maybe enough that you haven't reached the level you need to to be a healthy pond, but at least you're not having cyanobacteria blooms. And we'll monitor this and do plus or minus alum um, as we need to. So um, the second uh, short-term item is addressing stormwater, as you saw in the pie chart, not a huge source of phosphorus, but some. So just like with addressing uh, with the alum, maybe get some for this way as well that we can improve uh, the situation in the pond. So again, a lot of monitoring with this. And so there's a request tonight for an appropriation uh, so we can do some stormwater improvements. Um, so the last, oh. you know, the other thing which gets interesting in all this is because it's septic systems, that's the Board of Health jurisdiction. So as public works director, I, I really don't have a whole lot to do with um, how we manage our septic program. We certainly work with the Board of Health and the Health Division, um, but we can't really, you know, if those 13 people wanted to put in alternative systems that reduce phosphorus, they could solve the problem on their own. I'm not suggesting that they should or need to do that, but that is an option. Those systems could be replaced. There are systems in Massachusetts that are being piloted right now and they can be used provisionally that do reduce phosphorus, doesn't eliminate it. It's sort of like with nitrogen system that the Barnesville Clean Water Coalition's doing. These uh, innovative systems that reduce nitrogen, they could help. Um, so that's another option that homeowners have to address uh, the problem in their own backyard, literally. So that's Shubal Pond. I'm just wrapping up here. Just Long Pond, Marsons Mills. Uh, we did the monitoring in 2021. And the uh, management plan report came in in August. We are now in the process of reviewing that. Actually, we have reviewed it, providing comments back to SMAS, and we anticipate the report later this month. The preliminary findings, I don't believe they're going to change based on our comments, um, is that phosphorus reduction, again, from septic system is going to be necessary to improve water quality. In the case of Long Pond, where it was 59% in Shubal Pond, it's 86% of the phosphorus load is coming from septic systems within 300 feet of the pond within that contributing watershed. Again, not all the homes contribute, but where the groundwater is bringing it into the pond, those are the ones we got to be concerned with. The problem on the short-term solutions for this plan, and this is why we have to look at every pond separately, because they're each unique. They each have different chemistry and different inputs and different numbers of homes. Um, so we don't have the situation uh, with that, that alum could be effective in this pond. We don't have the conditions at the bottom, the depth, uh, the anaerobic uh, activity that alum would be effective. So we can't do that short-term solution here. Um, so we would, we would need to expedite uh, some kind of sewer expansion there, but that's very, very difficult given the, where that is, that's in the extreme west part of the town. Um, and um, that's gonna be honestly quite a ways off. Uh, but we are, there are other alternatives in the report. Uh, we're evaluating other options uh, that could include um, um, floating wetlands, you know, things that can remediate phosphorus within the pond. Um, issues with septic systems, working with the homeowners there. That's a very active and interested uh, group that lives around that pond. They may be very interested in, uh, hopefully a number of them, pursuing alternative septic systems to start improving the health of this pond before we can get sewers out there. Um, so that's, that's just a quick, uh, not too quick, but hopefully uh, informative uh, brief on our ponds program and our CWMP status and we'll, uh, in the future, take up other issues, and I'd be happy to uh, hear from you if there are specific things you're interested in hearing about, I can uh, uh, address those. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Thank you, Director Santos. Any questions on the side? 
Councilor so Mendes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, hey, Director. I was just wondering, are there any um, incentives, uh, state or locally, for the alternative systems? I'm not aware of any. Uh, there may be, uh, but I'm not aware of any for, for individual homeowners. Yeah, there are, um, you know, I did hear of one, uh, like a, like a $5,000 credit towards an innovative system. I'll see if I can get some more information on that. But it's not, you know, it's not a real popular or overwhelming thing, yeah. but there may be. Thank you. There may be some opportunity. All right. Thank you. Look on this side, any more questions? Council Rep. Gossetti, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Dan, for the update. And um, thanks for the update on Craigville Beach Road, which is pretty rough. Yep. Um, who, do you know who the uh, contractor is that's going to be? Lawrence with? Lynch. Lawrence Lynch. Um, with regard to the number of properties, you referenced Shubal Pond having about 13 properties. What's the number at Long Pond that contribute? Do you know? I, I don't. You know. I don't know. I have to, I'd have to look at the report. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thank you. Council Starr, please. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Santos, for that, that uh, presentation. So I think the, the 13 homes on the north side of Shubles are contributing phosphorus, but, they're, if, but, if you look, but if you come back a little bit and look, look at all the houses north of there, there are a lot of, I mean, the sewers aren't for the 13, just for those 13 houses. No. There's, there's, there, are, there are a lot of hydrologically above that, there are a lot of um, other homes there that are contributing phosphorus and will for a long time. Well, that, but that phosphorus isn't necessarily getting to the pond yet. Yes. It's, it's so those 13 right, yeah. that are contributing to the pond. Yeah. Yes, there are others. There's a golf course up there, um, above there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that's interesting with septic systems and phosphorus is these um, contaminants move in what's called a plume. So it's like a plume of smoke coming out. It's a smokestack. It's just in the water. And um, if you move the uh, disposal system 20 feet away, you now have a whole new path of soil that can take up phosphorus. So th you know, that's a potential option, you know, at least it stop the source. Because um, if it's full, it's going to stay there. Yeah. And if you can yeah. then move that disposal portion, um, then you have new sites available. Um, so we're looking at that as well. So in, so in Long Pond and Centerville, they just put in the first um, a, a, um, alternative system to take out phosphorus on fresh water. So that, um, it's just a private resident did it. Did it. So it would be interesting to see how that goes. Absolutely. I mean, we, have a lot, we have a lot to do with nitrogen, but only one that is specifically focused on fresh water and, and phosphorus. So we're behind a little bit. But thank you. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Any questions for Director Santos? Councilor Cullen, please. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So I have a question about the residents around Shubel. Those 13 homes, are they all year-round residents? Because that would matter, right, if they were here only in the summertime or if they were? Um, I, I think they either all are or the majority of them are. Uh -huh. I don't know specifically. So even if, we, even if alternative systems are installed today, we're still going to deal with 30 years of phosphorus entering the pond. It no, just it's it's um, it's not like it's in the water in 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 just moving and it will continue. Okay. If you stop it, it's like taking the pressure off. Okay. It's not being pushed into so the pond anymore. So it's not going to move. Right. Oh, uh, I see. Okay, that makes it a little more palatable, I guess. Um, let's see. I guess that those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Colm. Council Neary, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Director Santos. Just a couple questions I have. If you could just reiterate effect on public health with alum. If um, any. there's, it's not, it's pretty much inert and it's not, not harmful, not toxic. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, just driving around Craigville Beach, I noticed that uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, catch basin type work done there. Does that occur in the last stage or? Are they already in there and I, and I missed it? In terms of stormwater runoff around those roads? Um, that, would have, um, that would have been done already, yes. So I, I don't know what extent of catch basin work there was done there, but that would have been done already. And the final we grading the will, will obviously drive the water to, to those oh, yes. areas. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Neary. Anyone else on this side? Okay. Thank you for the oh, Vice President Schnapp. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Dan, uh, for a very comprehensive um, presentation, even though you deep dived into a few things. Um, I have three questions. Uh, one starts with the water, and I really appreciate your um, information about drought and how, how deep our water really is. I just wanted to connect that to the fact that we're also looking for new sources of water because we have deficits in our water supply. Um, is that, is, are those deficits as a result of growth that, you know, we need more water? Is it a water quality issue that's contributing to that need to find alternative sources? No, our, um, so there's a couple of things there. We want alternative sources because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So we don't want all our source, all the water coming out of one location in case something, well, things did happen. And it's nice to have other locations. But also, so we predict growth. We look at uh, the trends for water use over the years and we predict water use into the future for 50 years. And because this takes a long time, we wanna make sure that uh, we have enough water, water quantity. So it's not related to the, the drought issue. Um, we just need more water because we don't have enough production capacity. But that can be engineered with the installation of new wells. Right, thank you. Uh, now on to uh, the wastewater. Uh, you, I think in one of your diagrams you'd shown that some of the gravity line sewer is completed. Uh, what, what do you anticipate the connections of the homes along those gravity lines being? In the next 12 months, or is that? that yeah, when the, um, in the, probably next spring would be the earliest that okay. that would occur. And have we uh, surveyed the homeowners who would be connecting on whether they're going to have that as part of their assessment or whether they're going to go privately to have those connections? Is that? So the, the connections are going, all going to be done privately. Okay. Um, it turns out there's uh, financing available through the septic loan program, and if people want to get assistance that way, they can get the, the long-term loan through the county at a low interest. Okay. Um, but um, so the town doesn't need to. We won't be on private property installing okay. connections. We just bring it up to up to the property line. Okay. So that that's kind of a little shift from our discussions when we passed the sewer ordinance uh, a year or so ago that, you know, we were kind of packaging the whole Right. Assessment. There's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of concern and issues with um, working on private property, access, rights. You then, you know, where does the pipe come out of the home? You're then into plumbing, and then you're into plumbing codes and building codes, which aren't the public works bailiwick. So it, it made more sense, which is typically done. Right. You provide a stub and then, you know, our concern was being able to have people have a financing option that was affordable and through the county program that was provided. So that seemed like a good, good, good way to do that. I mean, it, it seemed complicated to just do the bidding for all of that. So that's, right. I'm glad <laughs> right. that this alternative is available. And uh, I know we'll be discussing Shubal Pond um, a little bit later in the agenda, but I have to commend your staff for the excellent work they've done on all these phases of the surveys and the, imp the plans, and I'm sure the implementation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vice President Schnapp. Any other questions for Director Santos? Thank you for the in-depth uh, kettle pond style uh, <laughs> presentation. It was very good. I appreciate that. And it's great for the public to understand exactly what we're doing moving forward and uh, all the good work that the DPW is doing and presentations. And again, I echo Vice President Schnepp when I really appreciate it really is a model study of what's happening with Shubal and I look forward to seeing what's going to happen moving forward with the other ponds. Okay. Uh, that is the end of Town Manager Communications. Uh, next item uh, would be to act on the minutes. Vice President Schnepp, could you help me with that, please? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to make uh, a motion to approve the minutes of the Town Council meeting held on September 1st, 2022. Second. We have first and a second. Any discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, Assistant Town Clerk Janet Murphy. Councilors. Atzlis. Yes. I'm going to do it that way. Keep going. Thank you. Clark. 
Yes. Cullum. Yes. Rob Crescetti. Abstain. Levesque. Yes. Mendes. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnepp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Abstain. Eight to two. Thank you. And moving on to uh, Council of Communications uh, from elected officials, boards, committees, staff, commission reports, correspondent announcements. Councilor Rapp Garcetti, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as liaison to the Mid Cape Cultural Council, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, make an announcement that the grant cycle is open and the deadline for applications is October 17th. And interested parties can find more information on their Facebook page and Instagram pages, as well as the Mass Cultural website. Um, they can also come to the grants reception, which is next Thursday from 5 to 7 at the Geyer Barn, or, or email the uh, Cultural Council for more information. And thank you. Thank you, Council Rep. Cassetti. Any other announcements? Council Cullen, please. Yes, I just wanted to mention to everybody that this Sunday from 12 to 4 is Hyannis Open Streets, where the whole town gets together and appreciates each other and sees new things and learns new things about the town. So it's going to be fun. There's activities all day long. This is my Deborah Dagwan plug. She used to always talk about Hyannis Open Streets and still volunteers like crazy for it. It's a Herculean effort by the Hyannis Civic Association. Thank you. Thank you, Council Coleman. I was wondering who's going to mention that. So that's great. Thanks for carrying that baton. Any other councillor communications? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Vice President Schnapp. Thank you, Mr. President. Just uh, say hey, you. Hey. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to give everyone a preview that the town council strategic planning process will commence in October. Um, we've scheduled our first uh, virtual meeting on October 13th. Uh, we're trying a little bit newer approach this year where we'd like to start our process with what is called a SWOT analysis. Many of you know that you analyze your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, we'd like to get as much input as possible from staff and committee members, so we, we may be doing some survey work before the, the SWOT, or our actual meeting. So just wanted to give you a little heads up on that. You'll hear more about that soon. Thanks. Thank you, Vice President Schnapp. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting time. Lots of uh, opportunity for public input as well. So looking forward to that. And just uh, to piggyback a little bit on uh, Councilor Cullum's announcement of open streets, it's actually supposed to be a beautiful day. It is. In the open streets, we've struggled in the past with rain. And uh, from what I've seen in the forecast, uh, it's going to be 80 degrees and 50, only 15% chance of rain. So looking forward to that. Should be a great day. Any other Councilor announcements? Okay, not seeing any at this point in time. We're gonna, before we start the orders of the day, we're just gonna take a quick break. So five minute recess, uh, please. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome everyone back. Our Barnesville Town Council meeting, September 15th. Um, just going to start the orders of business, uh, orders of business for the day. Uh, the first item of, of old business is item number 2022-159. I, I do have some concern as far as um, notification and um, outreach to the ones, the businesses I, or the organizations, I should say, that will be most affected by the change in zoning. And um, at this point in time, I would entertain a motion to um, open, I'm sorry, um, open the public hearing and move, continue the item to the town council meeting on October 6th. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Any discussion from the council? Council Mendes, please. Was there an attempted at outreach? Um, so anybody want to speak to that? Maybe Director Jenkins, please. Thank you, President Levesque, Elizabeth Jenkins, Director of Planning and Development. So under Mass General Law 40A, and we have talked about this a number of times in this forum, when you have a zoning map amendment, notice is provided legally under that statute in a newspaper of gener general circulation. And we have amended that notice through a email list, a zoning update email list that the town keeps. Um, it is notice is not provided um, necessarily to affected landowners um, within the district. However, part of our mission in the town of Barnstable is to effectively communicate with our residents and our landowners and our property owners. Um, so in this case, we did feel like it was appropriate to pass that notice, the zoning email update notice on, make an attempt to pass that, that notice on to property owners in the district um, via email. Uh, you know, email is an unreliable form of communication, and um, it was unclear exactly who may or may not have received that. Any other question? Any follow up? Good. How many abutters did you reach out to? How many were there that, that you tried to email? Uh, it was property owners within the district. Uh, I don't have that list on me, but I, I'd say approximately 10. Uh, it's a relatively small district, and again, we were not attempting to contact all tenants um, within the within the district. There, there are many business parks and things like that, um, but the property owners within the district. Please. Well, it's troubling because, again, it's the same thing we talked about the LCPC. If you have to reach out to ten people, pick up the phone. You know, and it's. Ironic that it's another Zion Church, if I'm correct, another minority, marginalized community that I feel is being ignored. Now, this bill on its own is very important. I've received emails from constituents who actually use medical marijuana and they have a hard time getting it. So again, we're delayed because we're incompetent. All it does is it takes a phone call or a letter. We've already discussed the email thing. You already admitted it, it, it doesn't, it's not reliable. So again, we have failed. And we have failed a marginalized community. I'll just say we do not have a protocol in place for this type of outreach. It's not something we do regularly or is part of our process. And again, we're certainly willing to go the extra effort over the next two weeks to make sure we remedy that. Thank you, Director Jenkins. Any other uh, discussion from any of the councils? Council Kalman, please. Yes, I would just say that um, I, I do agree that there should be some sort of a protocol that, and I'm, I'm sure we'll ad adopt one now, um, where we actually do reach out and, you know, as representatives of the public, it's our job to respond to the criticism thereafter. So we're getting heat, so that's why we're bringing heat, I think, more than anything. But it's, I think, appropriate to continue the item so that we're sure we can get all the com communication out there that we need to get out there. Um, and then have a, a lively debate and vote on it. Um, 
So I'm glad we didn't, we haven't lost the opportunity. We're, we delayed the opportunity, I think lesson learned and we move forward. And also, it, I feel like as a counselor, when, when something big is going down in my precinct, I definitely communicate as much as I possibly can. So if things are going down in your precinct, it's good to communicate um, and not depend on staff necessarily um, to do that um, since we are the representatives of the people, you know, so thank you. Thank you, Council Cullum. Any other? I will say that I'm uh, just to offer some input in regards to this when this item was coming forward. Oh. Um, Attorney Nowhere, we don't need to read the item necessarily, correct? Because we're open and continuing. Correct. Open and continue public hearing for October 6th, yes. And just to give a little history on this, too, is, is that. Um, just being the fact that, you know, again, it's not so much the abutters, it's who's affected um, by that. And in this case, we're, we're looking at setbacks. And again, I'm not looking to debate the item at this point, but just saying that the ch there's churches that are directly affected. And when I followed up with churches to find out if they knew what was happening, uh, their response was they were either um, didn't know about it or that it was taking place and or um, weren't clear about exactly what was happening. So with that, I just felt it was appropriate um, to further that outreach um, so that it is clear path moving forward. Um, and that again, and this has nothing to do and, um, and, and, and honestly, um, the applicant was um, uh, right in line of what was happening. So it has no reflection on the applicant whatsoever moving forward. So with that, any other discussion? Councilor Cullum. I just wanna say one other thing that, you know, these are the same churches I believe we reached out to to help us with COVID. And, you know, they're considered community partners, I think. I, I feel like the collaboration is, is really important as we pursue this equity piece with the town. Um, and maybe the policy moving forward, you know, will be to keep that forefront in our minds to, to make sure we're including those that we, we've been talking about needing more representation from, um, especially when they're, they're helping us get vaccinations to people who you know maybe in maybe wouldn't know how to get there and they've been supportive of our our mission um you know lesson learned oversight it's just an oversight and we move forward and and there we have it but you know i think there there comes a time when you know it it isn't just one department's responsibility necessarily it's all of our responsibilities i feel and um, I think it's important to say that, that as, as advocates and legislators, it's all of our responsibility. So I'm glad you did check, and I think that that's, this is a good fix, and we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Cullum. Council Steinhilber. Yeah, I just wanna reiterate that, you know, we did have a protocol, and it was just to follow what's required of us, but probably four years ago now, we stepped outside of that on a particular issue. And one of the concerns when we did that, that it would lead to kind of a hodgepodge approach to how we were doing uh, outreach because we didn't have that standard. And it's really on us, I think, to get a protocol in place so that every situation is treated the same and it's predictable and, and, and people know that. Um, but I think we've kind of left after that time, we kind of stepped outside of that. Um, it's kind of been made up as we go a little bit, no one's fault per se, but we really need to spend some time and get a protocol in place so it's very predictable and everyone can expect the same communication. A blueprint is always good. Any other, Council Schnapp, did you want to add anything else? Yeah. I, thank you, Mr. President. I would agree with Councilor Steinhilber uh, in looking at the next agenda item. We have another example of amending our zoning ordinance and what would our requirements be for notification. So I think if we have something in flux, it's difficult to have an expectation that certain people are contacted and have feedback. So I think, I think we do need to work on this. And it may be helpful for the public's even if it's not required for us to read the item, just so people know what we're continuing? Sure. Okay. As, as long as I'm not, um, I'm, 
it wasn't exactly how I was directed by the town attorney to do that. So uh, town attorney Nover, um, Vice President Schnepp would like the item actually read. Yeah, okay. So Vice President Schnepp, if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an item of old business, item number 2022-159, amending the code of the Town of Barnstable, Part 1, General Ordinances, Chapter 240, Zoning, Article 3, Chapter 240-30E4, by amending the separation requirements of the Medical Marijuana Overlay District. It does require public hearing and a roll call two-thirds full of vote of the full council. Um, we're asking it to be continued to the public hearing to be continued to our next meeting on October 6th. Opened. It, it is open and continued. We had the open and continue and we seconded it. So, but thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so with that, um, we do need a roll call vote, I'm assuming, on the, on the vote as it stands. Okay, so all in favor of opening and continue the public hearing to October 6th for this item 2022-159, you can um, show your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Any, ab any abstentions? Any nays? Okay, and that's what we're doing. Thank you very much and thank you for your patience. Next item of old business, um, Council Schnepp, actually, if you could please, item number 2023-011. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an item of old business, item number 2023-011, amending the code of the Town of Barnstable, Part 1, General Ordinances, Chapter 240, Zoning, Article 5, Section 46, Home Occupation, and Article 3, Section 14, RC1, and RF, Residential District, Subsection C, Conditional Uses, to update requirements pertaining to home occupations. This is a public hearing requiring a roll call vote of two thirds of the full council as written. Second. We have a first and second, and we have senior planner, Jim Cumber, here for the rationale. Oh, there it is. Thank Jim Kupfer, Senior Planner, Planning and Development, uh, here to present to you Home Occupation Ordinance as, um, as is proposed uh, Town Council Item Number 2023 um, As the Town Council may uh, recall, this item was uh, presented to you, to you um, and forwarded to the Planning Board, where on August 22nd, the Planning Board held a public hearing uh, on this item and recommended back to town council uh, approval of this proposal with an amendment, and we can get into that amendment here shortly. Um, in your package, you have uh, the home occupation uh, redlined as proposed, and again, a planning board amendment with one additional amendment to it. Uh, it's important to note the home occupation's original intent. It's the intent of this section to allow for residents of the town of Barnesville to operate a home occupation within their dwellings. Um, obviously, as you all know, uh, times have changed uh, over the years. Home occupations have become fairly prevalent, uh, especially here on Cape Cod. Um, and this is a response uh, to not only that, but uh, the voices of the community who express concerns about our current uh, ordinance. And, um, and this is a way to hopefully improve upon that. The intent here in this amendment is to focus on the impacts of home occupation as opposed to simply location. That's essentially how it's established uh, today in our ordinance, uh, to allow for home occupations by right for those with really no impacts and to allow for additional home occupation opportunities by special permit uh, for those with maybe some minimal impacts uh, in their day-to-day -day operation. Uh, it's important to note and remind the council, as you all know, a uh, special permit then allows for a public hearing and notices to direct affected abutters. So when someone right now is applying for home occupation, this is the map they encounter at first. You guys probably have seen this before. It's, it's, it's extremely convoluted. I, I can read it because I stare at it every day, all day, but for someone who's, who's looking to just run, you know, 
a simple business out of their, out of their home, uh, this may be somewhat daunting to them. And the first stop they go to is our excellent permit coordinator, Maggie Flynn, and she's going to look at a map similar to this. And those in the shade of the yellow and that uh, like pinkish red, those require a special permit, no matter if there's no impact at all. The white, you're allowed to do by right, as long as within uh, certain conditions. So, you know, there, there's a lot of impacts with that, a lot of concerns with that. And Maggie on a day-to-day -day basis and, and Brian Florence, our building commissioner on a day-to-day -day ba basis, have to work through those issues and try and work with these homeowners that have to go through the special permit process simply because of location and not, not impacts. And so if I, if I may, if I can invite uh, Brian Florence, our building commissioner, up, he can speak more thoroughly on that. Thank you, Jim. Thank good you, evening. Commissioner Florence. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the town council. Brian Florence, your building commissioner. So um, Jim did a great lead up, uh, but before you can talk about what a home occupation is, you have to understand what those are. Um, when the current ordinance was written, it was focused on contractors like carpenters and landscapers and things like that, um, and, and generally without employees. The ordinance has been in effect, in effect for decades since then, and we've learned a lot about home occupations and what those include and what they really are. So what is it? Artists, crafters, online influencers, housekeepers, office cleaners, computer professionals, contractors, financial professionals. Uh, we had a guy who uh, made Hollywood um, costumes. Uh, another example is a potter in Katuit. Um, this, this lady wanted to work out of her small 10 by 12 shed, make 10 or 20 or 40, 50 pots and cups and mugs and things like that and bring those to craft fairs. Um, as you'll see in a moment, we had to deny her registration. Um, the principal way that we meet our home occupation registrants is that banks require businesses to obtain a certificate, a zoning certificate, before they'll give them a checking account. Without a, without a bank account, our citizens can't use the financial services that these banks have to offer, obviously. As I said, our current home occupation ordinances uh, have been in place for decades. There's two districts in our town that prohibit home occupations as of right. That's the RF and the RC1 districts. Those two districts represent the entire west half of Barnstable. For various reasons, including fairness issues, which I'll discuss in a moment, my predecessors have had to use creative interpretations of our zoning ordinance in order to issue many of these home occupation registrations in the RF and the RC1 districts. Since I came here in 2017, as a responsible gentleman, I have to interpret the ordinance the way it's written. 24046 of the ordinance is written in a way that it prohibits home occupations in those two districts. As I said, there's a fairness issue with that. People on the east side of Barnstable are allowed to have a home occupation without a special permit. People on the west side cannot. People who can afford to have a survey done and afford the application process to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, they can have a certificate. The people that can't cannot. The cost of a survey for a half acre lot is approximately $3,000. The cost of an attorney to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals is upwards of $3,000. And then there's an application fee to go to the Zoning Board. So you start approaching seven to $10,000 uh, to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals because you live on the west side of Barnstable and you wanna make a couple of bowls and bring those to a craft fair and you can see that there's clearly a, a fairness issue there. The current proposal balances the home occupation ordinance by allowing as of right registrations throughout the town with oversight for those, uh, those occupations that would cause problems for the neighbors by requiring a special permit. And as Jim said, that would require a public hearing, notice to neighbors, and they would have an opportunity to let the zoning board know how they feel about that in their neighborhood. As Jim said, the world's changed a lot since the current ordinance was written. 
if you think about it, the World Wide Web and the computer uh, that enabled those industries weren't in their infancy in 1995 and 96 when those ordinances were written. In 2022, more people own their own cottage industry business and those that are not online with their business use the internet for things like bookkeeping and banking and those types of things. They can't do that under this current ordinance. They can't even have a, a, a bank account under the, the way this ordinance is written. As your enforcement officer, we receive 2,000 or 3,000 complaints a year in inspectional services. Of those complaints, uh, the subject that is complained about the least is home occupations. We do get a couple, no question about it, but they are the least of, the, of our worries. So as it's written, uh, it's one of the most difficult ordinances to enforce the way it's being proposed at, at, on merit-based, it would be a lot easier and it'd be a lot fairer. Um, I'd like to applaud the efforts of the Planning and Development Office for what they've done with this ordinance. They did a really good job, it was very thoughtful. They reached out to the other departments in town uh, and they were thoughtful about their approach and I, I think they did a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Florence. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the planning board held a workshop regarding zoning issues and the potential future amendment. Uh, council forwarded to the planning board. Planning board held that public hearing. And now this evening before you um, is the amendment, the two third vote to formally adopt. Um, if we could, uh, I would like to bring up just the recommendation that the planning board did uh, add or uh, recommend uh, to town council. Um, a simple uh, red line, actually, Director Jenkins, if you don't mind, it's uh, the um, recommendation. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. So this, this is incorporating what the, uh, what the planning board did uh, offer as recommended language, essentially, I would like to just highlight that uh, the original ordinance that uh, Brian referenced from uh, the mid 90s uh, specified real estate and insurance office. Um, and so this recommendation is to move away from specifying just those simply two industries and focus broadly on offices. This is in the prohibited use uh, section. So it would allow for someone that does their day-to-day -day administration within their dwelling unit, uh, but would not allow for public access. So that was a recommendation from the planning board. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Councilor Ansels, please. Thank you. Uh, this may be a question for um, Commissioner Florence, but this is timely for me because I've actually received um, some couple of phone calls from uh, residents in my precinct who have expressed concern about a landscaping company that's operating, has operated for many, many years, like I'd probably dare say decades, um, and but it's gotten to the point where they're storing, they have equipment on the property, um, they have trucks, um, you know, parked uh, on the property, um, wood piles and things of that sort. <clears throat> um, whether it's urban legend or not, um, the, the property owner has told concerned neighbors that he's grandfathered. Um, so I guess my, my question is, is a landscaping business allowed, and, and I assume this is, you know, we're part of the east side of, of, uh, of town, uh, and then take it one step further, if it is, uh, you know, equipment and things of that sort, is that, is that per, would that be permitted? That's a great question, thank you. Um, so, the only thing this ordinance allows is one vehicle, less than one ton, that's a DOT rating. So, an F, think an F-350 is a one ton. Anything above F-350 would, would not be permitted in, in a residential district. And they're allowed one trailer. So, that's just a guy in his wheelbarrow kind of a corporation, right? The ones that bring in um, multiple vehicles, multiple commercial vehicles and trailers, those are not allowed under this ordinance or any other part of the ordinance. So the only way they would be able to be grandfathered is if there was a, a variance that had been issued at some point down the line or if their, um, if their business was created prior to zoning. Uh, and you think of like the Cape Resources is, is one of those. They have a variance that is in place. Um, it's in a residential district, but it's allowed to exist there because of the variance. Okay, um, thank you for that. Follow-up, 
quick follow up? Of course. Um, so with that in mind, is there any sort of, is there monitoring that we do or is there, is, what's the, is there any enforcement or is it one of those situations where if you're made aware of it, then it's, then it's checked on? This is another great question and, and very apropos. We only have four inspectors. So we can't police 76 square miles. Our, all of our complaint-oriented um, activity is complaint-based. So if, if there's a neighbor out there, uh, uh, Councilor Steinhuber can uh, attest to this. If a neighbor complains, you let us know. We go out, we investigate. We look at the past history of the property. If there was a variance in, in place that protects it, we notify the complainant. If there wasn't and, and it's a violation of our zoning ordinance, we enforce it. And we have one that's very similar to this on, is it Great Marsh? Great Marsh Road. We had multiple excavators and dump trucks and they had to move. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council Atlas. Anybody else on this side? Anybody else? Council Starr, please. Thank you, President Levesque. So my question is, so why, um, so you want to open up the whole town to, to home occupancy. So why don't we do that first? So if we did that, how, how is this different than what's within what's, what's there now? I don't have a red line version in front of me. Part of the problem. So the difference is that there are two zoning districts where it's prohibited, and it equates to about half the town. So, why, so, so if we just say open those up. That's what this does, sir. Does, what else does it change beyond that? Um, it, it takes out single family houses? No, it just, it just says that if you live in a residential zoning district, that you are able to have a home occupation under certain scenarios, certain circumstances. But you crossed, you crossed out um, single family homes. Is that in the red line that was just presented, you just, you showed, just it showed to you? It's, yeah, it says so dwelling. It just says dwelling. It says dwelling. So now it says dwelling? Yep. So, so uh, that, does that include a rental or a condo? All right, so uh, Director Jenkins is about to pull up the red line version so I can walk you through that. So the first one under the intent, yes, it does strike single family. Uh, so it's dwelling units. So yes, if you're in a condo and you can create a, a uh, home occupation that is not impactful to uh, your neighbors, absolutely, that, that is an allowed uh, use under this this update, um, it, it, it does allow for it throughout the town now. Um, and if, if you go, oh, nice, I can control it here with, with this. Uh, <laughs> and if, uh, if you do create impacts in the red line version, there is that special permit uh, criteria that is a little more robust than the original ordinance. Okay. And so it, it does create some uh, checks and balances. And if there are impacts, it requires special permit. So again, as I originally started, um, it's not about location anymore. It's about impacts. And so we're, we're getting rid of, uh, you, you live on west side or east side, it's about can you, can you have a home business that's not impa gonna impact your neighbors? And if so, you should be granted that home occupation. And so, my, so my question is, who, um, is it up to Mr. Florence to decide um, what's objectionable and detrimental to the neighborhood? So yes, so, uh, Brian Florence, the building commissioner, is the, uh, the, the zoning enforcement officer and, and is the, uh, the person that will review um, for compliance, yes. No, he has to decide this before. This is by right. Yeah. Complaint driven. Complaint driven. Oh, boy. OK. I, I can certainly speak to a, a specific section, if you'd like. Um, so. So by right, you can have a trailer, a 20-foot trailer? So we can yes, but you can't have any storage. So that trailer, can, does that trailer have to move, or can it be full of stuff? Would you like to speak to specific? I, I think you may be talking about an enclosed trailer. So it has to be associated with your home occupation. So if you're a landscaper and you have an enclosed trailer and you have your tools in there, you can hook it to your truck and your vehicle, and can you, so can you have a trailer and just use it as a storage facility at your house? No. Okay. That, that's not the intent of that ordinance. That, in, that ordinance is intended to allow somebody who uh, has a small home business, home-based business, to be able to operate their business. And I, and I would just 
touch on a, a on the condo if I if I could. Think of somebody who has a house cleaning business and they live in a condominium. Yeah. Uh, they have a little Prius or a small car, a small van that they have their cleaning supplies in. Uh, sure, they would be allowed to to have that. Would they be allowed to bring uh, four dump trucks and and that's no, they would not. Okay. And so when it comes to when I make a decision, it's based on that long list that you see in there. The home occupation prohibits uh, more than one trailer, a vehicle over over one ton. It prohibits you from having. Um, you can, now this would allow one, I think, or is it one or two uh, employees? Two parking. Uh, one well, one employee, four. but you couldn't have a house full of employees there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It keeps it really low key, yeah. like you would see in a residential neighborhood. Okay. And it has to look like a residential house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Vice President Schnapp. Thank you, uh, Jim. I just wanted to know what how we're defining permanent resident. It's, it's in B1. Right, the under B1. The activity is carried on by the permanent resident of a dwelling. I, I mean, I'm guessing that's either an owner or a renter. But I, I, again, I just don't know what sure. our intent is when we have that. So, I don't know. Oh. Yeah, so in the application process, they would certainly identify that, but either Maggie or Brian. Yeah, if you're a short-term rental, you're not going to have a business in the in the town. <laughs> Permanent resident, if you have a lease or you own own the property. Okay. I'm going to stand here with you, Jim. Okay. Yeah, that works better than bouncing back and forth. But yes, <laughs> in the application process, the the applicant who resides there would file the application with Maggie Flynn, our permit coordinator, who would vet it to make sure that they are, in fact, residing there. Um, and and as as Brian mentioned, it, it it wouldn't be for very likely for a short term rental because they're they're producing this nine times out of ten. And speaking with Maggie, a lot of these is just simply to get the address uh, for to open up as as the Commissioner mentioned uh, bank accounts and what have you to get that business certificate. Uh, so a lot of these are nondescript, no impact whatsoever. Um, and so, I, but I understand, you know, your concern, your concern there, absolutely. Any other questions? Council Steinhebel, please. Just a quick comment. When you do open a business and you go to the bank and you're going to open up an account, they actually do a drive-by of the address you gave them as your place of business. And they want to make sure that it's actually a place of business. So that's what he's referring to. That would be that would be difficult. To, you can't open a bank account. So, thank you for that. Any other? Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate that, Jim, Brian, Commissioner Florence, I should say, and Maggie. I know you didn't get up and talk, but uh, appreciate all your work that you do to to help. Uh, really, our con our constituents, our residents, our business owners, uh, navigate. You know. Um, town hall in a way, so they can provide for their families and live their dream, so to speak, of owning their own business. We appreciate that. All right, um, it is a um, public hearing. Is there any public comment? There is no public comment on Zoom for this item. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other, I'm gonna leave it open for a little bit, but any other council discussion? As Vice a councilor on the west side, I'm very much in favor of this ordinance. Okay. Any other? Okay. Um, so I'm going to close the public hearing and. I don't know when it's appropriate to amend. No. No? Okay. I have it. <laughs> At this time, I would like to. Uh, recommend a amendment uh, based on the planning board's recommendation. So I would like to move to amend section one of item number 2023-011 as follows. By deleting subsection 15C and footnote two in their entirety from section B of chapter 240-46 and inserting the following new subsection 15C 
in place thereof. 15C, offices which provide public access, provided that offices that are used only for administrative purposes shall be permitted. Second. Second. We have first and second. Any further discussion? Just as a reminder, we are basically saying offices which pro provide public access are prohibited, but we're allowing administrative offices. So just so the context of that. The clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Schnapp. Um, so we have amendment on the floor. Um, at this point in time, I would just, uh, uh, let's do a roll call vote, please. This is on the amendment. This is on the amendment. Councilors, Cullum. Yes. Rap Grissetti. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Mendez. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnapp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. Atzlis. Yes. Clark. Yes. Tw 10 yes. Excellent. So now we have an item before us as amended. Any other further discussion? So I think we need to, um, well, is Attorney Nober, do I need to um, read it again as amended or can I just say, can we vote on it as amended? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the item as amended. Thank you. Second. First and a second. And roll call vote, please. Councilors, Rap Grissetti. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Mendez. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnapp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. Atzlis. Yes. Clark. Yes. Cullum. Yes. Excellent. Thank you again for your, your, all your work on that. Really appreciate it. And for the citizens of the West Side. And, uh, and there are, and especially for all the influencers in Marston's Mills. <laughs> there are a lot of them. TikTokers. TikTokers. He says as he scratches There's his There's nothing else button. to do out in the mills. <laughs> 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 With that note, Councilor Cullum, please, if you could help me, 2023-022. All right, I'm going to try to be cool. All right, this is item 2023-022, appointments to a board committee or commission. The airport commission, Mark Guillaume, as a regular member to a term expiring 6-2025. Human Services Committee, Kimberly Crocker-Crowther as a representative member to a term expiring 6-2025, Land Acquisition and Preservation Committee, Catherine Gulliver, as a regular member to a term expiring 6-2025. This may be acted upon with a majority vote. Second. We have first and second, any discussion? Okay, not seeing any. If you could uh, uh, raise your hand and say aye, if you agree with the item. Aye. 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 In favor? Thank you. Any uh, object? Any abstain? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Council Steinhilber, moving on to the next item, 2023-024. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to open the public hearing on item 2023-024, appropriation order in the amount of $75,000 for the purpose of funding the local match requirement for a federal grant from the United States Department of Agriculture. Natural Resources Conservation Service in the amount of 200000 for design and construction of stormwater improvements at Old Shore Road, Katuit, as written. Second. And first and second, we have Director Santos here for the rationale, please. Thank you. This grant is for the design and implementation of the Old Shore Road Stormwater Treatment Project to improve water quality in nearby shell fishing areas under the Watershed Flood Prevention Operations Program uh, of Cape Cod Water Resources Restoration Project. The project will install a stormwater best management practice adjacent to the boat ramp on Old Shore Road in order to improve water quality. This project will be completed in partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, will provide funding, who will provide funding for uh, the design, as well as 75% of the construction costs, totaling up to $200,000. The town is responsible for the permitting and 25% of the construction costs totaling up to $75,000. The grant opportunity is a reimbursable grant for expenses up to $200,000. The town is required to provide a minimum of a 25% match, and the total town expenses are anticipated to be $75,000 for this project. The town's matching funds for the project will be provided from the Capital Trust Fund, which has an available balance of $14,774,637. Thank you. Thank you. 
This is a public hearing. Um, is there any public comment? There is no public comment on Zoom for this item. I don't see any in person. Any discussion on the council? Council Rep Cassetti, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dan, for the information um, you provided based on the, uh, was it APCC? Yes. Yes. Um, I think that was back in 2017 they yes. were proposing this. Given the fact that the town owns very little property uh, adjacent and it's primarily private property, is there any plans to outreach to the neighbors to see if we can go on there? <laughs> well, there aren't plans yet. As we go through our design, we'll understand better what the ownership is, whether we can fit it within the, the right of way or have to seek um, either access or easement from an owner, but that will be a part of the process of the permitting. Good, good. Thank you. Council Starr, please. Um, Mr. Santos, I think I'm missing something. So um, $75,000 is, it, um, it's, it's, it's a minimum 25% match. So 25% of 200,000 is 50,000, so. But we're providing in-kind services oh, for the permitting. Okay. okay, thank you. Which has value. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Thank you. Thank you, Council Starr. Any other council input, discussion? Not seeing any, let's uh, roll call vote, please. Councilors Levesque. Yes. Mendes. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnepp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. Atzlis. Yes. Clark. Yes. Cullum. Yes. Rob Corsetti. Yes. 10 yes. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next item of business, uh, Council of Star, please, 2023-025. Oh, thank you. Um, this is uh, old business, um, open for a public hearing, roll call, two-thirds full council vote. Um, number 2023-025, appropriation order in the amount of $145,000 for the purpose of funding stormwater improvements at Shubo Pond, Marston Mills. Second. Thank you. Second. We have first and a second. Director Santos, please. Thank you. In response to deteriorating water quality in Chubal Pond, the Department of Public Works retained the Coastal Systems Program at UMass Dartmouth School for Marine Science and Technology to conduct a diagnostic assessment of Chubal Pond and to develop a management plan to address water quality issues. We have completed the diagnostic assessment and developed a final management plan for Chubal's Pond. Shubal Pond. The findings of the consultant's report can be summarized as follows. The pond is being negatively impacted by excess phosphorus loading, the largest source of which is septic systems, followed by internal pond sediments and stormwater. Management of phosphorus inputs is necessary to improve water quality of the pond. The various sources of direct stormwater inputs into the pond were found to contribute a relatively small amount of total phosphorus into the pond with the largest of these sources being the Shubal Pond Road outfall pipe. In order to further reduce the phosphorus input from the stormwater, it is recommended that improvement be made to reduce the inputs from this outfall pipe. The proposed improvements to the Shubal Pond Road outfall pipe will consist of the installation of additional infiltration facilities upgradient of the pond uh, to reduce and eliminate direct discharge to the pond from the pipe. Due to the large contributing area to the Shubal Pond Road outfall pipe, the pipe will remain in service, but only as an emergency overflow for a 50 or 100 year storm. But for the average, most of the storms and rainfall we get, uh, which is um, the first inch of which is where most contaminants are in a storm, uh, that will be uh, addressed by this system and treated. Funding for the project will be provi provided from the Capital Trust fund, which currently has a balance of $14,774,637. Thank you. Thank you. Is a public hearing. Any public comment in regard to this item? There is no public comment on Zoom for this item. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, council discussion? Council Thank Star, you. please. So does this, um, Mr. Santos, does this um, reduce any phosphorus going into the pond? Yes. Does it, how does, how does it take it out of the system? Are they, oh, the, the, go ahead. Well, it'll, it'll, it will be leached into the, um, through the system, and then 
it will act somewhat like a septic system does, but there's not a lot of phosphorus in stormwater, as we found out in this case. Okay. So there's you know, decades and decades of capacity there to accommodate the phosphorus that will be coming through the stormwater um, in the leaching system. Okay. You can't put an alum filter in the bottom or anything? <laughs> no? I don't okay. think so. Just thinking. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Vice President Schneider, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Director Santos, is there any other benefit we'll receive from the stormwater management uh, proposed here, other than the phosphorus removal? Uh, well, sure. Any, any stormwater has many contaminants. Um, has uh, salt. It has uh, suspended solids. It has uh, you know grit. It has uh, oils and gas, hydrocarbons, and all of those things uh, would be treated in this system. So it definitely has a, a benefit beyond just phosphorus. Great, thank you. I just, um, any other council discussion? I just want to say thanks, Dan, to you and your staff in regards to um, the work that's being done here. Uh, this was something that uh, was, you know, brought to my attention early on when I became a counselor, and it's been a constant discussion in regards to um, really, I mean, we we can't do all the stormwater um, um, at the same time, obviously, because it's got to be budget's got to be prioritized. I know we did the, the good work over at Long Pond, and um, we continue to do good work with this project here. So again, I really appreciate um, the efforts that gone forth, and I know my constituents around Jubal's Pond especially appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, not seeing any. Roll call vote, please. Councilors. Mendez? Yes. Neary? Yes. Schnepp? Yes. Starr? Yes. Steinhilber? Yes. Atzlis? Yes. Clark? Yes. Cullum? Yes. Rob Corsetti? Yes. Levesque? Yes. Ten yes. Excellent. Thank you. Director Santos, you can stay right there. And uh, Councilor Rob Corsetti, if you could please, item number 2023-026. Yes. Uh, uh, this is old business, public hearing, roll call two-thirds, full council, item 2023-026. Appropriation order in the amount of 95000 for the purpose of funding an alum treatment for Shubal Pond, Marston's Mills, as written. Second. First and second. Back to you, Director Santos. Thank you. This is the second of the two short-term actions to address uh, water quality in Shubal Pond that I mentioned in my uh, original presentation. Uh, so in response to the deteriorating water quality in Shubal Pond, uh, the uh, SMAST um, that has determined that the most effective long-term solution to manage the pond and improve water quality uh, is wastewater management for those properties with septic systems contributing the phosphorus load. Uh, these properties are currently identified in phase three of the comprehensive wastewater management plan, and as a result, we'll be recommending uh, advancing the timeline to phase two for that aspect of it. In the short term, however, it is recommended that alum treatment be used to address the internal phosphorus loading source or the sediments in the bottom of the pond to improve water quality. Given that the internal sediments only contribute a small amount of the phosphorus load to the pond, alum treatments will not eliminate all potential for cyanobacteria blooms. However, the alum treatments will help reduce the available phosphorus and as a result are expected to improve water quality and reduce the frequency of water quality impairments such as cyanobacteria blooms. It is expected that alum treatments will be required approximately every three to seven years. DPW recommends water quality monitoring to evaluate the, effectness, the effectiveness of the alum treatments and assess if or when additional treatments are needed. Obviously, if this is approved, we will, in fact, uh, include water quality monitoring in our annual monitoring program. Funding for this project will be provided from the Capital Trust Fund, which has a current balance of $14,774,637. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. Any public comment? There is no public comment on this item on Zoom. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the Obviously, moving forward, when do you suspect, obviously, we're doing this now as a supplemental appropriation. When do you expect the possible treatment to take place? Do it in the spring. In the spring. Thank you. Um, just asking that question of my constituents. Any other council questions? Discussion? So make sure I close the public hearing. Not seeing any, roll call vote, please. 
Councillors Neary. Yes. Schnapp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. Atzlis. Yes. Clark. Yes. Cullum. Yes. Rap Garcetti. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Mendes. Yes. Ten yes. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos. Um, moving on to the next item of business, uh, uh, Council Mendes, if you could please, item number 2023-030. Uh, thank you. This is new business. Uh, item number 2023-030, refer a public hearing on 10-6-2022. Appropriation order in the amount of $1,337,890 for the purpose of funding the restoration work to the Zion Union Historical Museum, original chapel, located at 296 North Street, Hyannis, Mass. Second. We have first and a second. Again, referring to a public hearing. Um, all in favor of moving this um, item to 10 6 2022 please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item of new business, uh, Council Clark, please, if you could. Item number 2023-031. Thank you, Mr. President. New business may be acted upon by a majority vote. <clears throat> this is agenda item 2023-031, resolve approving and adopting the Town of Barnstable 2022 Hazard Mitigation Plan Update, dated April 2022. Well, welcome back to the podium. Our we senior, need a second. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, second. Thank you. First and second. and. Uh, Welcome back to the podium, Jim Comfort, Senior Planner, for the rationale, please. Thank you all. Thank you for having me once again. Uh, yes, before you this evening is our 2022 Barnesville Hazard Mitigation Plan update. It's a long time coming, and I'm excited to bring it here for uh, potential adoption. Um, one second. All right. So. Uh, the, why I say it's a long time coming, our previous plan was uh, completed in 2010 uh, and was adopted at that time. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, additional uh, planning processes have been in place. Uh, and later in 2016, uh, an attempt to update the mitigation plan uh, was thoroughly progressed, but ended up not making it through the MEMA-FEMA process. Uh, so a lot of the work had been developed over time, and obviously since 2016 to now, a lot more has changed. Uh, luckily, the town of Barnstable has uh, undergone a number of planning initiatives that helped inform this process over those years. Uh, in 2018, uh, the town of Barnstable uh, uh, completed the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness uh, program, and in 2019, followed up with a climate resili resiliency workshop, which again, helped inform and update the process. Um, I should state that you know we, we present uh, we the planning department and, and others present plans to the town of Barnesville and, and town council uh, many times. Um, this one's a little bit different in that it's extremely prescribed. Uh, this MEMA and FEMA have a very strict, rigid standard in which we need to adhere to, um, and we have done and we have developed this plan uh, in accordance. In 2021, some of you actually, and, and others who were in the audience, uh, <laughs> attended our half-day workshop uh, in November that, uh, that started to pick up the pieces from 2010, 18, 19, and so on, um, and started to engage in what we've achieved and what we still have left to do. Um, we followed that, that half-day workshop with several interviews with stakeholders, uh, regional partners, uh, such as uh, folks from Woods Hole, uh, the Cape Cod Commission, and others. Um, we then placed the, the draft plan uh, for, for anyone to, uh, to comment uh, for two months. Um, and then held a, a public meeting with the planning board on March 14th, 20, uh, 2022. Uh, then went back onto the town website with all the updates from any comments that were received. Um, it also was in the newspaper. It was picked up uh, by some of the local news, town managers report, et cetera. Um, it was then submitted to MEMA. 
who gave us uh, a very favorable um, uh, a recommendation uh, fairly quickly, but then kind of stalled at FEMA, not because of the merits of the plan, but simply the turnover and, uh, and lack of staff, at least from what they provided to us, uh, which is why, um, as many of you sat through the half-day workshop, we're here almost a year later uh, before you uh, with this plan. So part of this plan here, I know it's been online and, and you guys have it, uh, but just for the, for the general public, just quickly going through some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, this this uh, update looked at the goals from 2010 and looked to update those accordingly. Uh, so these are our five goals. It's followed by several objectives that are within the plan. Again, all really focused on current hazards and how to, well, like the title says, how to mitigate those hazards uh, in a reasonable manner uh, with uh, engaging our experts. So we really dove into touching uh, Director Santos and his crew, uh, working with our, uh, um, our fisheries, our, um, our, our natural resources folks. Everyone who d deals with this touches this on a day-to-day -day basis. We try to get all their feedback on you know, real goals and objectives that the town can achieve here, um, as this is just a five-year plan. Uh, this isn't looking too far out. Um, we looked through this plan and, and touched on a number of statistics, and I should state that when I say we, it's just not me and, and, and the, the department and, and others. We actually uh, had a, a terrific um, consultant who's assisted many other communities uh, ar around Massachusetts that helped guide us to get us to this point where MEMA and FEMA uh, look at this favorably. Um, again, we, we touched on a number of statistics, 15 natural hazards, 109 critical facilities. As we all know, some of those critical facilities like sewer pump stations that may be in the floodplain, our, our uh, local shelters, um, all of these were identified uh, throughout um, critical hurricane zones, critical flood zone, that's a, that's a huge item for us. Obviously our, our hospital is, is in and close to one of those. Uh, so this, you know, these are all, none of these are new to, to all of us, but are identified here in the plan. Um, again, just touching back those, those hazards, those are, these are the ones that are in the plan. In the plan, it dives much deeper into detail about what specific nor'easter or what specific flood. Um, and is, in my opinion, good reading, but uh, you, you, can, <laughs> you can take upon that. Um, so here, here is our mitigation actions. Obviously, you don't, you don't need to read uh, that there. This is just a sample of a greater spreadsheet that touches on kind of the format of how we structure these mitigation actions. We not only are identifying these, but we, we address some objectives, some ways in which we might be able to get this done in the next few years. And then what I think is, what, what is a key part of this p key component, which our consultants was excellent at assisting us with, is identifying potential funding sources uh, to go towards these because we all know every single one of these is gonna need a funding source and we can't all do these locally here. So there's a lot of great state and federal resources and uh, we tried to match them up as best as possible. As you'll see, uh, as we implement this plan, um, it's gonna be very specific to those funding sources and when they come out, when grants come out, we'll now be able to identify those grants, match them up with potential projects, and, and be on our way. And with this adopted, we're now eligible. This is, we've been held back because of the fact that we don't have this adopted plan. Uh, furthering this plan is just potential projects. So this again, this is mostly informed by the 2010 an initially and further by 2017, 18, 19, and all of our, our local experts and regional experts and state experts that helped uh, provide input on uh, reasonable projects that can be identified and uh, hopefully achieved in the, in the near term. Um, next steps here and in future planning initiatives. So here tonight, I look for adoption of this plan. And with that, we can get our formal approval from FEMA. Uh, and again, be eligible for certain grants and, and mitigation funding. Um, it's also gonna inform certainly our, our 
our update to our local comprehensive plan and other planning initiatives and guide future development. I mean, we talk about uh, you know, our pump stations that may be just too low in a, in a floodplain. What should we be doing to address that? What should we, we be doing to, in future development plans to maybe mitigate some of those concerns? And this will help uh, at least point us in the right direction. So again, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this. Thank you, Jim. Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you very much, Jim. So um, once adopted, will this plan now be on the town's website instead of the 2010 mitigation plan? Absolutely, and actually the, the current draft as it's approved by MEMA is on our town website under the planning department under climate resiliency. Uh, we have our plan, uh, the big button climate resiliency has all of our, um, our, our hazard focused proje uh, projects and this one is front and center. Okay, I have a hard time finding some things uh, sometimes under what um, title it's under. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clark. Any other council discussion? Okay. Thank you very much again. And um, without seeing further discussion, I believe this is a majority vote. So those are in favor, raise your hand, please. Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And that is our last item on the agenda. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Roll call. Did we do a roll call on this one? No. Can we do a majority vote on that? Okay. Yeah, all in favor, raise your hand and signify saying aye. aye. It's unanimous. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.